Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Shirley, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to get it out of the way right now. This is a Nice, Texas accent. (laughs) It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be asked to do this. Pat called me last week and asked me, would you like to speak at Jamboree? And I said, but we don't have local speakers. And she says, well, the Spanish speaker isn't turning up. We can't afford to fly anybody else in. (laughs) So my sponsor keeps my ego in check, (laughs) just in case my head got big about being asked to speak. Um, I want to thank the speakers who have spoken already, all of you. You told my story, so I think I might as well just go home. (laughs) Um, It's amazing the similarities and the amount of identification I get with everybody who speaks, be it at a convention or just in our local meetings. And men and women, I never in my life thought I would identify with a man. Never. Um, I never liked men very much. You know, um, Gloria was talking the other night, saying, last night, saying she, she didn't like women. And I was exactly the opposite. I had all, my friends were all female from very, very early on in my life, and I, and I didn't like men. And God obviously wanted me to like men because I had four sons. So he he decided that he was going to teach me to like them. But um, like Tammy, I have to start at the beginning. I don't know where else I get really confused. Um, I was born in Glasgow, Scotland, and um, was born into really extreme poverty. Alcoholic family, isn't it amazing how many of us have that in common? Um, and, you know, I was, I was thinking the other day, I, I have a, a book at home with pictures of the area that I was brought up in. And some people that are close to me here have seen them. And I, I hear talk of the barrio here in El Paso. Well, that to where I came from is a, probably like moving into Tennis West, you know? I mean, it, the, the, the difference, uh, we lived in, in tenement buildings. Um, I'm the eldest of six children. My mother actually had a living, but only six of us lived. And I was the firstborn. <clears throat> the um, she sort of had a baby every year. My mother was was Irish Catholic. Her name was Rosie O'Leary, and um, and she married a, a Scottish Protestant, which is not a good mix. Um, <laughs> Glasgow is very much like uh, Northern Ireland. We fight a lot about religion, you know, and. Um, you you actually even your even our soccer team I say soccer, we call them football teams back home. But our you guys call it soccer, so here we go, I'll speak American. Um <clears throat> our soccer teams in Glasgow are Glasgow Celtic and Glasgow Rangers. And Glasgow Celtic are Catholic and Glasgow Rangers are Protestant. And until about fifteen years ago, no player of the opposite religion was allowed to play for the opposite team. That's how bitter and, and stupid we, we were about religion. And of course, there was a lot of Irish Catholics in Glasgow that came over during the potato famine and, and they had a depression 
also in the 30s. And um, so we had a lot of Irish in Glasgow. And, you know, my mother had all the... She just kept having these babies. And my dad was a drunk from... The day I have any memory, my dad drank, and and it's a national pastime for the in in the whole of United Kingdom. Um, drinking is the thing. You don't go anywhere where there is an alcohol. You know, I mean, it just doesn't happen. So I was brought up in in real poverty because um, my dad didn't. Well, I won't say he didn't like to work. Yeah, well, he didn't like to work. Um, and and he'd get a job for a wee while and then he'd get fired because he was always drunk or he never went because he had a hangover and and my my mum she used to I remember my mother scrubbing shop floors tearing money if he does and I also remember her um we, we'd sit down for whatever there was to eat and her always saying she wasn't hungry. Um, and that, that's just how it was. And, you know, we, we literally, I mean, I can remember going maybe three days without any food. And we have a fantastic meal over there called fish and chips. And it's the stable diet. And there's fish and chip shops everywhere. And I was reading a book um, about a year ago called Angela's Ashes. And the identification I got with the children in that book was unbelievable. And there was even one bit where people, you get fish and chips, you used to get them in newspaper. They're not allowed to do that anymore because it's dirty. But for years Forever, people ate their fish and chips walking along the street at a newspaper. And then they'd just bundle their paper up and throw it on the ground. And I can remember picking up a piece of newspaper that fish and chips had been on, sucking on it. And I'd pick an apple core up off the street and eat it. Um, and that's just how it was. It wasn't any... There was lots of kids like that. That's how it was. That's how we lived. Um... And I didn't know any different. Um, I was talking to my sister last week on the phone. We talk every week. And uh, we were taught, I said, I want a swimming pool. And she says, really? <laughs> and I says, yeah. And I, I wonder if um, my backyard's big enough. Oh, but I don't think I could stand the mess. Maybe I ought to just move to a house with a swimming pool. And then the, she started laughing, and I knew what she was thinking. And it was like, um, Shirley, do you remember when you didn't have a pair of knickers? <laughs> That's underwear in American. <laughs> and I do. You know, I mean, we just didn't have any. And here's me talking about blooming swimming pools, <laughs> you know. And it's just amazing how um, things change. I, <clears throat> I identified with, with Gloria. She had her first drink at 13. I was 14. And that was a, that was a funny year for me, 14. Um, I, I used to go to Sunday school. My, my granddad left, let, ran away with another woman. My, my paternal granddad ran away with another woman. And I was about four at the time, and my mother had three and a half kids then. She was pregnant with the fourth. And my granddad ran away with this woman. <clears throat> so they decided that I could go live with my granny in the same street. And I would keep her company and cheer her up and help her and... You know, I was I was four years old. <laughs> that that was my job. And so I went to live with my granny, and um, and that was okay actually because I got more food. And um, and she was a, she was a nice lady. She drank, but she was a nice lady. She used to 
I'd live there for a while, and then they'd take me back, and then they'd send me back here, and, you know, that went on quite a bit. No wonder I drank. And um, and that was okay, but, and she used to make me go to church. And I, I went to this Sunday school. Um, it was a really nice Sunday school. It was a Methodist Sunday school. They're not like your Methodists here. Um, it's all very relaxed, and we don't have a lot of lay preachers back home. You know, they're all very, they're all Catholic priests and Protestant ministers, and they all wear the dog collar, all of them. And, you know, really posh people go to church, people with nice clothes, and they don't want to sit beside a little smelly girl with no knickers on. So, and, and, snot in her nose and no hanky and doing this that wasn't um and they used to they you know i could feel that even as a child that i was different for these people and i didn't belong in their church with them so i found this little sunday school and i used to go and i loved it and they didn't care and they used to they used to give us cookies um so i got something tea and they'd have lemonade and so i, I got something really nice to drink as well and um, I ended up at, at sort of 14 taking the baby class at Sunday school because I'd been gone for a long time. I got it on seniority. And um, they, <clears throat> I liked that Sunday school. And they, um, I used to go to the badminton club on a Wednesday because they'd have something to eat there too. And then I'd go on a Friday. I'd got a Bible study because I'd get something to eat there too. So I had uh, three meals a week planned and um, was a lot better off than a lot of other people, I can tell you now. And um, anyway, this thing came up in Glasgow, and I don't know to this day how I got involved in this, but there was a the Temperance Society. Does everybody know what the Temperance Society is? They don't, they're against alcohol completely. Nobody in the whole world should drink, and drink should be taken off the face of the earth, alcohol. And um, they started this thing that they were going around the local churches, well, the whole of Glasgow, and Glasgow's a very big city, and they were going to have a competition run by the Temperance Society to find a temperance king and queen. And they had to be Sunday school members. So the next thing I know is, like, Shirley, could you stand up and read this speech? Well, I was great at stuff like that. You know, I'm, an, I'm really a frustrated actress, I think. And I, I stood up and read the speech, and they said, okay, she's the only one that can read. Well, send her. So they said to me, you have to be at this place on this date and um, and go read that speech to them. So I went and read it to these people that I didn't know. And they told them at the end, there was a few other girls and boys there, and at the end of it they said to me, well, you go and you do the speech for the southern Glasgow region. So I went and did that. And um, I won that. And then... I had to do it for, we were all in the competition for the whole of Glasgow. Now, don't forget, I'm, I've got sweaters with holes in, and I, I didn't have shoes. Do you know what Wellington boots are? Rubber galoshes? Is that what you call them in America? I had to wear galoshes, and it was summer, because I didn't have any shoes. And um, there's me, this scruffy little thing, up there, and um, did this speech, and one for the whole of Glasgow. I was now temperance queen of Glasgow. Didn't know what had hit me. And I didn't even know what temperance meant. And, I, and my father was lying drunk every night and beating my mother up and starving us, and I'm the temperance queen of Glasgow. So there's a bit of irony in there somewhere. Anyway, um... So the, this day comes and, and I have to be crowned. And there's a huge park in Glasgow called Queen's Park. And I had to be crowned and the king's name was Jack Brown. I'll never forget him and he came to a really posh area. I mean, his, he had 
he had shoes and socks and stuff like that. And I did, and they told me I had to get a long dress to wear to be crowned in. And <laughs> I wore my auntie's bridesmaid's dress. <laughs> now, you have to understand, my auntie was about 200 pounds. <laughs> and I was about 40. And um, you should have seen the amount of safety pins in this dress. And it was big. I just stood front all the time. I didn't just turn to the side or anything because it was just all this bulk hanging out the back, you know. I looked deformed. Uh, <laughs> anyway, they put this big crown on my head and, and then you get a cloak. I got a cloak, a big red velvet cloak with white and black fur. So that hid the back of the dress. And then they put us in Jack and me in a horse and carriage and trailed us all around the city of Glasgow in this horse and cart. And, you know, the only person that came to see that was my grandmother and her cousin. There was another member of my family there because my dad was in the pub and my mum didn't have the money for the bus fare and she'd have had to have trailed all these other children with her. So that was that. But, oh, I was... I, Felt proud of myself, very proud of myself. I was temperance queen. And, you know, isn't it amazing now I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous? Um, that was when I was 14, and, and later on that year, I had my first drink. It must have been all the stress of being temperance queen. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was stuff, it was either called El Dorado or VP. They were the two, the very cheap. Now, people here talk about Mad Dog 2020, and I've never tasted it, but for what you say, that's very similar to what my first drink was. And um, it's thick red syrup. It's like cough mixture, really. And um, I drank that, and I was terribly sick afterwards. And I'm... Um, Hanging out, I was hanging out a window. There weren't any inside toilets in the places where we all lived. We didn't know. Five families shared the one toilet. Um, so I had to hang out this window, this ground floor window. And all this red stuff was pouring up. And I thought I was bleeding to death. I didn't, I, I didn't realize if it was red when it went down, it would be red when it came back up again, you know? And, um, that was my first, um, experience with alcohol um, and and that's what I can remember about it so that isn't really very glamorous you know I hear people you know like you Tommy said you felt it in the soles of your feet and no I just felt sick and but you know what the next time was better um, and that's when I got the feeling that's when I got the feeling I I became funny um, and I became beautiful and everybody I thought everybody liked me when I had that stuff inside me and so it was that good feeling that I never got for anything else um, now I, d I didn't become an everyday drinker at 14 it just didn't happen I got into a lot of trouble. When you were talking, uh, Gloria, and saying about running away, I ran away all the time. I was always being bought. And the police used to come and get you, you know, and they'd find you and they'd take you back and then you'd get battered and then you'd run away again because they battered you and they'd bring you back. And that went on. That was my, that was my teenage years. That was all I did was run away, get battered, run away, get battered. And my dad didn't mess about, you know, when he hit you, and, and I was talking to my sister about this, she says he always hit you like he'd hit a man. And I don't know why that, well, I suppose I just drove them crazy, you know. Uh, who knows, anyway. Um, <clears throat> when I was 17, I got pregnant with my first child. And then I got married. And I'm, I married the guy um, that that I got that got me pregnant. He was the father of the child. And um, my father, when we we lived in Germany, but in this time, my father had 
it gone into, we had um, what we call national service, you call cons conscription, is that right? Where you have to go into the army for two years. And they still, my dad went in and did his two years, came out, tried lots of other things and, and continued to just have this totally unmanageable life. So he signed up as a regular soldier. And um, so things did get better because the, the army gave us a place to live and, and stuff like that. And they took me back to live with them permanently because I was, you know, I was getting caught shoplifting and... Um, and I was truanting from school continually, and truant officers were looking for my parents to tell them, and they, then they found out and they took me back because I was out of control. And it was my grandmother's fault, of course. It wasn't anything to do with my parents. It was her fault. And um, so I lived with them, and we, we, my dad got posted to Germany. So we went to Germany, and um, this is when my mother started to drink alcoholically. And um, our lives were just awful. They were awful. And my dad done very well in the army, going through the ranks and, and stuff, and did very well for himself, but was continually drunk. I don't know how he did it. He just, I suppose he had the, and, and in the British Army, especially in a Scottish regiment, that was very acceptable behavior. <clears throat> anyway, I got married to, to um, my first husband, and... Um, this was a nice guy. He was an Englishman, but we don't hold that against him. Um, <clears throat> he was a nice, he was a nice man. He was a very nice man until he married me and he became a wife batterer. And I don't know why. Um, I had, now here's a little bit of history repeating itself. I had uh, three children in two and a half years. And um, my life was just wonderful. It was just diapers, 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 and more diapers. And that's all I used to do was wash diapers. This is going to fall off the screen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I didn't start drinking then, but I did um, have to go to the doctors and get some pills. Um I was talking to Gloria about that the other day as well. I told her I never took drugs. And um, I said, just prescribed things. <laughs> so she liked that. Um, so I was on, it was when um, I was, I was uh, 21, had three kids, um, and was on Valium, Triptosol, and Mogadon um, just all the time. And of course, um, I would take an extra one every now and again just to help me through. And basically, the marriage split up. Um, he was in the army also. And uh, I remember we, we got posted from Germany to Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is a very small island in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> and I really started drinking heavily there. They used to, they make brandy there. Um, not cognac, not nice stuff. Brandy is, um, you probably use it more for cooking than drinking. But you could buy a demijohn, which is, it holds about seven liters. And we were going through that in a week. Um, between us, and I still have these three little kids. Anyway, um, I had my first nervous breakdown in Cyprus. And they took me and they put me in the psychiatric ward. And then they decided that they really needed to get me back to UK because I was in a pretty bad way. And they took me back on a, a medical flight and they admitted me to a military, a British military hospital. And it was for psychiatric cases only. And if you were in any of the, the services, Air Force, Navy, or Army, that was the end of the road for a soldier if he was sent there. So I'm sent there. And uh, I liked it. I liked it there. Um, they, they kept me locked up, and they gave me my drugs regularly. And in between, I could get a headache and ask for a codeine, and they'd give me that too. So I, I was quite happy. Um <laughs> Most of the time, and um, 
That was fine. Eventually they told me that I was doing quite well and I ought to leave and that was very upset. And I'm separated from my three children at this time and they were staying with my, my, my husband, ex-husband's mother and, um, and I decided that I wasn't going back into that marriage and so I got a job in a hotel as a waitress and they gave you a room to live in as well. And um, I didn't last very long there. Um, was drinking, was going out partying, and um, ended up going back to my ex-husband and, and children. And, and the same thing happened. The beating started again and that sort of thing. And the marriage broke up. I took my three children and I thought, I'm never going to be separated from them again. This is awful. This is never going to happen again. And um got into the bad mother syndrome. And I took these kids and I had nothing. The, the, the only place I could find to live, it's, it's called a caravan site. It's like a, a trailer park, only not as nice. Um, a caravan's made of metal. And um, they're very, very small. So me and my three little boys went to live there. And it was very cheap. And uh in the middle it was in the middle of a place called Salisbury Plain. And that's where the military have all their big exercises, their maneuvers. And there's nothing there. All there was was this caravan site and at the entrance to the caravan site was a pub. Um a bar. And so the soldiers would all go in there and drink when they had time off. And one, one night I'm lying there and I, I kept hearing all this noise in the middle of the night. And it went on, it was, yeah, good night. And it, you know, it, drunks and things like this. And I thought, God, this isn't very nice. It turned out I was actually living in a brothel <laughs> with my three, and I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. And so that was a reason for me to, to try and commit suicide because look what I brought my children to. And I wasn't a good mother, so I might as well be dead because they'd be better off somewhere else and I couldn't live without them and poor me, poor me. And so I swallowed as many pills as I could get down and my three little boys were asleep in the room and we knew nobody that, you know, that... This is, this is the selfishness and the self-centeredness that we talk about. This is it epitomized. My three little boys aged four, three, and two would have uh, woke up to a dead person. And that never occurred to me. <clears throat> Very luckily, one of the um, self-employed ladies... Uh, <laughs> Needed some chairs. That's the first time I've heard it called. That's wonderful. Um, needed some change for something. And for uh, you, you talk about coincidence. No, no. She didn't know me from Adam. Nobody ever came to my door. And this woman came and knocked on my door to ask for change. And being so pretty brazen, when I didn't answer the door... She knew I was in there, so she came and knocked on the window. The window wasn't locked, so it was one of these things that go inwards. She pushed it in, and she's shouting, Hello! And I was lying right underneath her. And she was pretty persistent, because when I still didn't wake up, she got a stick and was prodding me through the window and um, got worried, called an ambulance, and uh, there you go. And that was that was my first real attempt at suicide. Um, They took my children away and they put them into the care of the local authorities and they locked me up in a psychiatric hospital. And and I was there for three months. And I remember this. They used to have a free church minister who would come round, and he was Methodist. He was one of the ones that wore the dog collar and everything. And he'd come to the hospital, the psychiatric hospital, every Wednesday, and 
come and talk to people that didn't have a minister of their own. So I was one of them. And I'll never forget, his name was Leslie Scrace, the Reverend Leslie Scrace. And he came into my, um, my room and he says, hi, I'm Leslie Scrace and I'm the Methodist minister. And I told him exactly where he could go and how quickly he could do it too. And he, he said, okay. See ya, and left, and the next Wednesday he was back, and the next Wednesday, and I kept saying the same thing to him every Wednesday. I don't want to hear about your God. Please go away. Don't believe in it. Why would, if there was a merciful God, why would he let me suffer like this? I'd lost God a long time before. Um, <clears throat> eventually, through him and, and a social worker, she was a Canadian we have a Canadian here today, I know that. And this Canadian social worker and this minister got together and they found me a home in the town where the hospital was. And it was a lovely home. It had three bedrooms, it had an inside toilet and bathroom, and it had a little sitting room and it had a kitchen. And... Um, they gave me my three little boys back and put us there, and the rent was so cheap. It was unbelievable. It was called an almshouse, A-L-M-S. And what it is is um, they usually give them a very old people that have fought in the war. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it was because I was temperance queen I got it. Um, <laughs> but they gave me this, this lovely wee house and, and me and my three little boys and um, moved in there. And I was still on all the tablets, and but they would only give me so many at a time now. And that was okay. Very shortly after moving in there, um, I decided one night that I deserved a little drink. I needed a drink for a while. And that, you know, I was lonely. And um, I never got out. And so I would go get a little drink, and I didn't have very much money. And I seemed to like these sickly sweet drinks. I went and bought myself a bottle of sherry, <clears throat> and I drank the whole bottle that night. And it, and had my, my little pills as well. And, you know, I was like, I feel no pain no more. And it done the trick again. Eventually, um. These really kind people that were trying to be nice to me, good Christian people, would offer to babysit so that I could go out. <clears throat> I'd find a little part-time job as a waitress in a tea room. And um, they'd, they'd offer to sit and I'd go out. And, and now it was time, you see, to try and find a man. I needed to find a man because I, I needed some company. And also I needed somebody that would maybe help me out a bit with the money. And so that was my quest. I was going to find a man. And um, I found quite a few. Uh, <laughs> never done me a bit of good. And um, I started drinking real heavily. Um, and it was every day drinking, every night drinking. I was always, a, you know, I was trying to be a good mother. I'd wait till the kids went to bed. Uh, the house started to get really dirty. And... Um, I wasn't cooking, and there was the odd occasion where there was no food. And I used to think, I'm getting like my mother, because my mother by this time was um, being arrested for being drunk and disorderly. Her name was always in the local newspaper, her and my dad fighting, televisions being thrown through windows, and I mean, it was vicious stuff. Anyway, I, I kept thinking, you're getting like Rosie. And then I'd think, no, I'm not, because I haven't done that yet. And I never knew a thing about alcoholism or alcoholics and honors. You don't talk about it in my car, or you didn't then. You do not talk about alcoholism. So um, I'd put that at the back of my mind, and I'd just go on. I'd be all right for a couple of days, and then down I'd go again. And this went on and on and on. Eventually, in a bar, I met a guy and we eventually um, got married, and he took on 
three kids because the the ex husband was gone. He didn't even come see them. Or the army took money out of his pay to give me to support the children. And um, <clears throat> I met this man, and and he he seemed he was twenty seven, and he was still single, and he was an officer in the army. And there it was. See, that appealed to me. And I liked him. I liked him. He, he was a nice man. Um, and, and you know, we would have a nice place to live and we'd have food and we'd have money. And I would be able to go to the officer's mess dressed up. And I was just, this was just wonderful. Um, and we had another little boy um, to our marriage. Uh, my drinking got worse because in the officer, officer's mess in the British Army, um, that's all you do. And you do it at home and people come in in the afternoon and you offer them a glass of sherry. And But you see, they'll have one glass of sherry and leave. And I'd be left there with a bottle or decanter and on and on and on. I don't have to tell you, you know. Um, but what was happening was I was starting to hide it. Um, every every closet and cupboard in the house was a potential cocktail cabinet. You know, there was just a bottle in the sleeves of coats, things like that. And I'm and I used to think, you don't need to do that. Why do you do that? And it didn't matter. I just did it. And I got. I used to think if we'd company see the, I couldn't let them see how much I drank. So I would have to sit there and sit, and then I'd say, if you just excuse me a minute, and I'd go somewhere else, and I, I was frightened in case they'd tear me under the lid, so what I started doing was I'd get glasses and fill them up and put them in different places. <laughs> and so it was all done, and you just had to open the door, quick, Fred, put it back. Um, <laughs> That that was that was how I was getting through, you know. And then I could converse with them, and and I could be very um. What's the word? See, I don't even know the word I'm looking for. But I I could get into their conversation, and I could take part instead of sitting there frightened to open my mouth in case I made a fool of myself. And I could be really witty. And I could be charming. And I could be beautiful. Because that's how alcohol made me feel. I was getting drunk all over the place, actually, in the end. And the pretend stopped. I couldn't pretend. I just had to drink, and I had to have that amount. Whatever it took for oblivion, that's what I had to have. Um... My husband was being embarrassed. Um, he was quite a high-ranking officer, and he'd take me places, and I would have to be carried out um, unconscious or screaming and fighting um, or throwing up, you know? Anyway, um, <clears throat> the British Army is very snobbish, and... <laughs> Princess Anne, who is the Queen Elizabeth II's daughter, was the colonel in chief of my husband's regiment. And we were once again in Germany, and Princess Anne was coming to do a visit. And we had all to meet her, the officers and their wives, not the other people, the officers. And them. So I was a very important person. I was getting to meet Princess Anne. And I remember all this, that there was rehearsals for months before she came, because we had to get this just right. And there was this, um, my husband was, we were to be in groups in the afternoon, and my husband was to take her around and introduce her to everybody in each group. There was about ten groups. And of course, because I'm his wife and very important, I was going to be in the first group. I was going to be the first person she shook hands with. And so we got the outfit and the hat and everything. And um, then there was this big thing about, will we wear gloves? 
who gives a damn, you know? But, no, it's very important, because are you allowed to touch your peasant skin to royal skin? You know, think about it, guys. It's the... <laughs> For four weeks, we had wives' club meetings, officers' wives' club meetings, where everybody was having an absolute fit about whether we should wear gloves or not. And, of course, that was a perfect excuse for me to get drunk because I was worried about it. I, I didn't, even, <laughs> didn't want this woman to be upset, for goodness sake. Um, I was also getting very annoyed at these women. You see, here am I. I'm this child with this poverty background with all these people that were brought up uh, lords and ladies and went to finishing school and and I'm a, you know, I'm for the Gorbals in Glasgow and I'm trying to act like them. I had to. I had to be important. I had to be special. And uh, anyway, the great day arrives and, and I was really worried about the gloves. So I, what do you do when you're worried? You, you have a few drinks before the occasion. And so... I had an awful lot of drinks. I think it was nearly finished a bottle of sherry again. And um, I'd been practicing my curtsy. You have to curtsy to them. You must. You can't. It's life imprisonment if you don't. Um, so I had to practice my curtsy. And I, and I was practicing my curtsy for, oh, God, since they started talking about it. And it's not as easy as you think when you're trying to be special and important. So I'd be in front of the bedroom window, a mirror, and I'd have the dress on, and I'd be doing it, will I do it that way, will I do it this way, will I do it for the waist? And I was so worried about all this stuff that I had to do. And she comes in, actually they moved me to the end of the line, I was now allowed to be first. Um, so they moved, that was a resentment. Um, <clears throat> so she comes along the line shaking hands with everybody and she got to me and I forgot to curtsy and I, cause I'd had a few drinks and I remembered when she was three people along and did it cause I'd practiced it. You have to do it if you practiced it. And, um, you know, it was like everybody sort of hanging their head in embarrassment again. That night there was there was a huge ball, a dinner and a ball that that she was going to eat dinner with us, and then and then we had the ball afterwards, and um, got another new dress for that. It looked lovely, and um, I had to we had to host my husband and I had to host a brigadier general and his wife, and these people flew in from England, and and this old lady she they were in their seventies, God love them. And um, she needed to go to the bathroom just before dinner. So um, I took her to the bathroom, and, and then I stood outside the bathroom, and one of my husband's uh, soldiers was acting as a waiter for the night, and he had a tray of champagne cocktails. And he came up, and he says, How are you? And I says, I'm fine. How are you? And how's the wife? And how are your children? And... Um, <laughs> And all of it, he says, ma'am, I think you need to go because Her Majesty will be arriving any minute. And so I ran into the bathroom to see if I could find the old lady, and I couldn't find her. And the bathroom was empty, and I'm in all the stalls looking for her. <laughs> oh, God, I've lost her, you know. Um, I thought, and I, I had to go back into the, the, the dining room. And so it was parquet wood floors, and I'm clip-clopping along in the high heels. <coughs> And there was 300 people at the dinner. And as I walked in the room, 299 people stood up. They just heard the, the high heel shoes and they thought it was her. And <clears throat> my table was about halfway down the room. And I just walked down that room nodding from side to side. <laughs> and my, my husband was under the table, hiding. <laughs> with embarrassment, and the old lady was sitting, in case you're worried where she was, she was sitting there waiting for me. Um, that night at the dinner, I actually fell asleep in my soup, literally. Uh, they'd had the fish course, 
they came around with the soup and I fell asleep. And, you know, I was, the embarrassment was awful for everybody who was there with me. And it just went on like that for years and years and years. Um, a friend of mine who had been my drinking buddy for 16 years called me one night and she told me, Shirley, um, I'm in A. Well, we have a, your AAA here is the Automobile Association back home. It's AA. And I thought that's what she was saying. Why is she calling me to tell me that? And then she told me, no, you don't understand Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, that was the end of our relationship as friends. My father also got an A. My mum didn't. She died of alcoholism. Um, she was 56, and she died of alcoholism. And she died, a bag lady got her drunk. Um, Liz, my friend, uh, that was four years went past. Things just got worse and worse and worse until I was literally dying physically. I could no longer eat solid food. I weighed 68 pounds and um, I didn't know what to do anymore and I called Liz up drunk my drinking pal for 16 years and it was on the um, 5th of March 1990 and I was crying and I was desperate and I've never felt so alone or so hopeless in my whole life my kids had grown up, and they'd gone. My youngest son was only 15. He'd, I'd left my husband, and, and he'd gone with his dad because he didn't want to be with me. And um, Liz told me, get on a train and come here tomorrow morning. And I got off the train, and she looked at me and just cried. And she took me to a meeting. And I stayed with her and her husband for eight days, and, and I never drank, and I went to meetings. And uh, we don't have treatment centers back home. They're just coming in now. And the place to get sober is in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the only place for an alcoholic to go in the United Kingdom. And um, I went to a meeting every day where, and, and the, sh- the withdrawals were terrible. And she told me, just just one more day. Okay, go an hour. And her husband was a school teacher, and they were frightened to leave me on my own. He took me to school with him, bless his little heart. <laughs> and he told, he told his colleagues and his principal that they were having a health and safety week at the school, so they, they said, she's a nurse, and we'll bring her in to talk to the kids. Now, can you imagine? There's me withdrawing for alcohol. Um, dying on my feet, and I'm going in to talk to kids about health and safety. It was interesting. I remember one, the kids were out in the playground, and they were calling them back in, and I was waiting in the, this classroom for the, them to come in, and it was big plate glass windows. And they were walking past, and I heard this little boy say, Miss, who's that in our classroom? And the teacher says, That's a nurse. She's come to talk to you about health and safety. And he says, she looks like something for outer space, miss. And he just summed it up, out of the word, mouths of babes. That's what I felt like, something for outer space. Didn't belong on God's earth. And we've talked about feeling bad, feeling like a bad person. I was a bad person. Um, I went back to the town where I lived and... uh, and I picked up a drink again. I couldn't stand it. Um, and, but I kept going to meetings. I went to meetings, and I would tell you, oh, this is great. I love this program. This is wonderful. Them steps, fantastic. And then I'd buy a bottle on the way home. And by this time, I was just sitting on my bed, drinking out the neck of the bottle. You know, and I couldn't go a day. I couldn't go a day, and that'd been four years of continual drinking. You know, I was under the influence of alcohol for four years nonstop. 
Um, I don't know when it got enough, but I know on the 19th of June 1990, I came home for a meeting and I had to drive along this really long road and it, oh God, it had so many sets of lights, it was unbelievable. And so I made a deal with myself and I said, if the light's not on red, if I ever, there's a, one of these lights, I think there was 25 sets of lights. If one of these lights is on red, I'm stopping and buying a bottle because I'm fed up with this. Well, do you know that it was the very last light that was on red and right next to it was a liquor store. And I pulled in and I got it and I bought what we call a quarter bottle. It's about this size of vodka. I never drank vodka till I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I'm serious. I never drank vodka to, cause you couldn't smell it, I thought. Of course you could. I mean, I've smelt it on other people since I got sober. And, um, and that was my last drink. It was very little. But something happened that night with, with that little drink. And I actually put orange juice in it that night. Put it in a glass and put orange juice in it. I was trying to drink like a lady again. And um, I was bouncing off the walls. I can remember not being able to get up the stairs. And I couldn't believe it with that small amount. And when I woke up the next morning, I still had my winter coat and my boots and everything on. And I called somebody and I told them I was still drinking. See, I could never be like you guys. You guys weren't bad. You were nice people. I was bad, and so that's why Alcoholics Anonymous wouldn't work for me. I went to a meeting that night, and I confessed, and that was June the 20th, 1990. I confessed that I'd been drinking since March the 12th. I got myself, a, I hadn't bothered with a sponsor in, and of course I hadn't, I didn't want one. I didn't want it to stop drinking. The last thing I wanted to do was stop drinking. And there was a man in the, that, those meetings, and his name was Gordon. And Gordon was two years sober. And I asked Gordon to be my sponsor. And Gordon's a very, <laughs> I mean, he really traditions, and he's very um, straight down the middle. He says, no, 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 my dear, it has to be a lady. <coughs> And I says, well, there's only four ladies here, and I don't want to talk to one of them. And he says, I'll do it for a little while till you find somebody you like. And Gordon stayed my sponsor for a couple of years, but I did get a female. That was in England. I was living in England at the time, but I used to travel up to Scotland all the time to meetings and things and conventions. And I got a, a sponsor there called Govan Rita. These people taught me how to live. You know, I didn't have a life before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I had an existence. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a life. I didn't want to know about God. You took the time and trouble to just sit patiently and wait for it to happen. And it happened. And I found a God in my understanding. And I attended meetings on a regular basis. We only had four meetings a week. <laughs> and I would travel 120 miles round trip to get to another meeting a week. And God had a Yugo. And I didn't think you'd know what a Yugo was in America, but everybody does. I thought if I told you that, you would, wouldn't even realize that... Um, Gordon didn't drive, he had um, seizures caused through alcoholism, and uh, he wasn't allowed to drive. Me and Gordon used to go everywhere in my Yugo, and he used to be frightened to death. He used to cling on to the seat like this. I remember once it was really raining hard, and you know, our speed limits are so, uh, you can take them or leave them. And <laughs> it was raining really hard, and we were going to a meeting about 60 miles away, and he says to me, you know, you could be driving a Mercedes at this speed. It was very tactful. 
you know, it was like, he didn't want to tell me to slow down. He, uh, you, you wouldn't expect a Hugo to be able to go this fast, would you? <laughs> and I looked and he was clinging onto the seat like this. And I says, are you nervous? And he says, I'm bloody petrified. <laughs> I says, Gordon, God's behind the steering wheel. And on I went. And um, we had some laughs. That man really, really, him and his wife, God love her. They took care of me. What you people in Alcoholics Anonymous gave me is something that I never found in churches or Sunday schools or anything. You taught me spirituality. All the other places tried to teach me, teach me religion. And um, I am in awe still today of what I've been given. I have been given a glorious gift. It's given to me on a daily basis. And I'm the only person that can take that gift away. And I'll do that by picking up the first drink. And just for today, I don't need to do that. Um, my boys are all... Oh, I have to tell you about my Ben. <laughs> Ben's my husband. I, mean, I came over here on a year's contract in 1973, and it's been a long year. Um, I was three and a half years sober when I arrived in El Paso, and um, you people just took me to your hearts and made me feel welcome. See, that's it, we alcoholics. It doesn't matter where you go in this world. You go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you're with your family. I met Ben. We ah, we saw each other around meetings for quite some time. And we started dating in December 94. Yeah? Um, and then we shacked up um, for a while. <laughs> and then we... Um, I'm learning all these new American expressions. It's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't swear till I came in Alcoholics Anonymous. Ah, there you are. I learned to drink vodka and swear in Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> um, we got married on May the 1st. It'll be two years on May the 1st. And we got married in Scotland. And... Um, all my family were there. And do you know some alcoholics to here flew to Scotland to be at the wedding? And that was just tremendous. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. We had a great time. He's a man that really works his program. He is, um, I love him to death. And he has real sobriety. I want what he's got. And his money. Um <laughs> My, one of my, my uh, two of my sons came to the came to the wedding. My youngest son, I call him my new age hippie. He uh, travels around smoking pot, doing acid. He lives in Amsterdam for six months. Then you'll find out he's in South Africa. Then he's in San Francisco. He goes places where he can get drugs real easy and not get arrested too much. And um, and I just have to let go of him, you know. The only, I hear of him when he's in trouble and he needs money, and that's okay. I know if I don't hear from him, he's doing all right. Um, the other three sons, one of them has never spoken to me since the day Ben and I got married. Um, he divorced his wife, and they have a little. They have two little granddaughters for that marriage. And because his wife was coming to the wedding, he wouldn't come, and he's never spoken to me since. God love him. If that's all he's got to worry about, God bless him and keep him. And my other two sons are doing great, and um, I love them. I can show them love today. They're very, very proud of me, and they're so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am saving four seats. Who has it said they were saving one? I'm saving four because they all have a problem. But, you know, I can't do anything about it. I don't even worry about it. I just know that, you know, and it's something else Gloria said. Gloria, you told my whole story. You even read my bit out of the big book. <laughs> 
And now I've lost it. <laughs> there was something else you said, and I thought, gosh, that's me. And I can't remember what it is, but it doesn't matter. God probably doesn't want me to say it. Um, I've been, I, I was very nervous before coming up here, and I really expected there to be about 20 people, because you should all be home getting your makeup on and washing and doing your hair for the dance tonight. That was what I thought would happen. But you know what? Um, I'm feeling real comfortable right now. I don't know how you people get it down to a fine hour. I have never done this before at a big conference. Um, you have your time and just great. I had so much more that I wanted to tell you, and there isn't time. But what I'm going to tell you is that I thank you from the bottom of my heart for my sobriety because I could not do this alone and without you there is no me and I love you all and thanks for listening to me thank you thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month Visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.